It's really a pleasure to be here because I love friends in the audience um, and I'm honored to have been invited um, to honor Ellie um, and her commitments to improving health care for people. So I have no conflicts to report. Um, I'm hoping that you leave here today very clear on the distinction between palliative care and hospice. Um, that you can operationalize the link between integration of palliative care throughout the genome of American medicine and the adherence to the central ethical principles underlying the work of all health professionals. And then lastly, identify the six characteristics, all of which are necessary uh, to achieve the desired outcomes of palliative care any one of them is missing, you are unlikely to achieve your intended goal. So I'm going to start with this slide that many of you have probably seen before. And actually, let me pause and ask who's here. How many students here? Public health students? Medical students? Nursing school students? Nurses? Social workers? Chaplains, doctors, people who run the show, managers, administrators. Who am I missing? Ethics. Ethics, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just walk, walk back. <laughs> Anybody else? Pharmacists. Pharmacists. Key. Key. Audience. Okay. Um, you should yell out if something I'm saying doesn't connect or doesn't make sense because it's a pretty diverse audience. Okay. So what this slide shows in the x-axis is the percent of the non-institutionalized population by healthcare spending level. And the y-axis is the cumulative percent of total healthcare spending. And to make a long story short, what this slide shows is that healthcare is spending is highly, highly concentrated on the care of the sickest, most complex patients. Which is no surprise, right? Healthy people don't cost much because they're healthy, so they don't need care. Sick, complicated people cost a lot because that's why we have a healthcare system, to take care of sick, complicated people. However, the implications of this concentration of healthcare spending on a few people has not reached the policy uh, consciousness, I would say. So we don't have healthcare policy that recognizes that the sickest, most complex people have very different needs than the other 90 to 95 percent of patients. And that's what I'll be trying to demonstrate to you today. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the value equation. Anybody here not heard of the value equation? Yeah, good. So I, when I went to Washington to do a health policy fellowship in 2009, I actually did not know what the value equation was, I have to confess. And it sounded really arcane and confusing and like what would a regular doc like me uh, have to do to understand this? And it turned out it was actually very simple, quality in the numerator, cost in the denominator. So what policymakers are looking for are medical interventions that improve, increase the numerator, and ideally decrease or at least not increase the denominator. So can somebody in the audience, let me focus on students here, give me an example of an incredibly high value medical intervention or public health intervention that saves millions and millions of lives at a cost of fractions of pennies per person. Yeah. Free and long zone. That's a good thought. Any other ideas? Even cheaper. Hand washing. Hand washing is a great one. Very, very cheap. Yep. Go back 100 years. Clean water. So the gain in life expectancy between 1900 and 1930, before antibiotics, before widespread vaccination was entirely due to separating clean drinking water from sewage. That is the highest value medical intervention there is, clean drinking water. 
Just note that that 30-year gain life expectancy predated everything we now consider to be modern medicine. And we all carry around this sort of faith that modern medicine is why we live so long. Clean water is why we live so long, because we survive labor and delivery, and our infants survive infancy. That's the main reason for the gain life expectancy. What's another example? It's vaccine, clearly. Um, vaccination, when, when we used to do them, um, saved millions of lives. Um, and these things, again, are incredibly inexpensive in return for millions of lives saved. Can, I wonder if anybody can give me uh, an example of a very low value medical intervention that doesn't particularly improve quality, costs tens of thousands of dollars per person, may actually cause harm or hasten death. Um, what, what are some examples of that? And don't all start talking at once. <laughs> Robotic surgery. Robotic surgery might be one example. We walked through Mount Sinai Hospital one day a few years ago. We have nine intensive care units. We seem to grow intensive care units. Must be something about how they get reversed. Anyway, we're growing a lot of intensive care units. And we walked through to see how many patients in our intensive care units had a permanent form of cognitive disorder, whether dementia or stroke or advanced Parkinson's disease. 40%. So these were people who were never going to be restored to any kind of functional baseline. But they were in the intensive care unit. And imagine if you were cognitively impaired, didn't know what was going on, people were tying you to the bed and sticking needles in you and tubes down your throat, you would experience that as torture. Um, and the cost is probably now about $25,000 a day per person. So modern medical care in the US is highly characterized by low value care. We do a lot of stuff that doesn't do much good at enormous per capita cost. So why am I talking about this in a conversation about palliative care? Because the data I'm going to show you will demonstrate that palliative care has a huge impact on the numerator, improving quality, a very significant and sustained and standardized impact on cost, reducing the denominator. Very few people do both. Very few interventions do both. So if you're looking to develop a high value set of policies or a high value healthcare system, you will fail if you do not fully integrate health care into the care of people with complex seriousness. <coughs> So this is Mr. and Mrs. B. This is a patient I actually took care of now about seven years ago. Um, Mrs. B sews all her own clothing, and she always makes a matching tie for Mr. B. Um, they came up in the 60s, so she was fond of op art. Most of you were too young to remember that. Um, this was their 60th wedding anniversary party. I was invited to it about seven or eight months after I met them. I took this photo, I have their permission to use the photo and use their story. I met Mr. and Mrs. B in the Mount Sinai ED. Um, it was around six o'clock at night. I got a page from the ED attending saying, Dr. Meyer, this is so-and-so, I'll call him Joe. I don't know if you remember me, I used to be a medical student and I rotated with you on palliative care like 10 years ago. I felt really old. Um, and I don't know if this is an appropriate consult, but this I have a couple here who is abusing the emergency room for low back pain, and that was his language. And I thought this was my student, said something like that. Um, and then he said, and I don't know if it's appropriate for palliative care because he's not dying. And then I just want to shoot myself because I really totally failed as an educator that this ED attending thought palliative care was only for the dying which is not true. Um, so I went with my current four-year medical student down to the ED where we found Mr. B curled in a ball on a stretcher, facing away from his wife, refusing to talk to anybody. And then it growled. His wife was really distressed. Um, he described his pain out of eight, as an eight out of a possible 10. And he was taking a lot of Tylenol, about five grams of Tylenol a 
day. Um, those of you in healthcare know that Tylenol is one of those drugs with a very narrow therapeutic ratio. So the same, very close to the maximum dose for pain or headache or fever is the dose that can destroy your liver. He was taking way too much Tylenol. Um, why? Because when he asked his doctor what should he take for his low back pain, his doctor said I should drink Tylenol. And the patient and his wife logically assumed that if some wasn't work, some wasn't working, more might be better. Anyway, it wasn't working. Seems in the ED. Uh, turned out this was his fourth ED vis visit in uh, two or three months. Two prior times also for low back pain, and one time for an agitated delirium due to fecal impaction due to back pain. Okay, so three prior ED visits, all for things we might agree might be best managed somewhere else. Okay. Why did he end up in the ED? His wife was in tears. Um, here's what he was saying, get me out of here to her. Why did you why did you call 911? I told you I never want to go back to that place. And he had had more than enough of our tender administrations by the fourth time in the ED. Here's what she said. He hates being in the hospital, but what could I do? I couldn't even move in myself, and I couldn't reach the doctor. Um, so I called the ambulance. It was the only thing I could do. So here's the story. After they had eaten dinner early, around 5.30, he had walked into the bathroom, sat down on the toilet, and when he went to stand up, his back spasmed, as it frequently does. Um, and she was, and he was, couldn't get up. She was trying to pull him up. She couldn't pull him up. He was screaming at her, leave me alone. I'll be fine. Leave me alone. She went and knocked on some neighbor's doors. Nobody was home yet because it was only 5.30. There's no doorman in their building, which in their particular neighborhood at 92nd in New York, there aren't that many doormen. Um, she called the doctor's office. She had, they have a local cardiologist internist doctor. What happened? It was 5.30. What did she get? What did it say? If this is a medical emergency, hang up now and call 911. Who's abusing the emergency room? It's a system design failing. It is not the patient and the family abusing the emergency room. They actually did exactly as they were told. As she said, it was an emergency to me. So let's think about um, what we did, me and the medical student, when we got there. So I looked through the chart. His creatinine was 2.1. So I couldn't give him any Motrin or Naproxen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or I would, as we say, box his kidneys. Tylenol clearly was ineffective. What's left for analgesia? Opioids. It's really the only class of drugs left, right? Looking back through his record, we were on Epic by then, there was not a single dose of opioid on the three. He had had three prior hospitalizations, three prior ED visits. I counted the number of physicians he saw, 87 between the three hospital stays, three different groups of house staff, etc. Not one person had trialed him on an opioid. So what differentiated me from all my colleagues is that I was willing to take that risk. I was willing to try it. Uh, because he was 88 years old and opioid naive and frail, I used a really tiny dose. So a starting dose for most people in this room with an acute pain would be about 10 milligrams of morphine. I gave him 2.5 milligrams, a quarter of that dose, in a concentrated liquid format, because that's the way you can get that low of a dose. And I didn't leave. Why did I stay by the stretcher? What was I worried about? Uh, worried that he might have breathing difficulties, that he might pass out. What was I worried about? What else? That his mental status might get worse, more withdrawn, or more confused? All the things we're taught to be very worried about with opioids. So I stayed there because I didn't want to walk away and have him decide to stop breathing just when I was walking. So not only did he not stop breathing, it didn't touch him. It didn't help the pain at all. So I waited 45 minutes until it 
might have reached its maximum. Um, and I gave him a second 2.5 milligram dose. So total of five, still much less than I would give you or me. Um, and in 15 minutes, he was a different person. He was, he turned over on his back. He was holding his wife's hand. He was flirting with the nurses, which his wife said was back to baseline. <laughs> he asked to walk to the bathroom. So what did I demonstrate to myself? effective as an analgesic, right? Not only did it not worsen his mental status, the pain was worsening his mental status. Relief of pain improved his mental status and his ability to function, right? So I at least proved that. Was I comfortable at this point sending him home with a morphine prescription? No, why not? Why would it not be safe since I've demonstrated it's effective and he tolerates it well? Why would I not just go ahead and write the script and send them home? Which, by the way, I eventually did, but what did I do first? It's good, good to explain to the board and all this better. Yeah, we had to do a lot of teaching with him and his wife. And we also had to understand something about the safety of the home, right? Which we do nothing about. Um, and Apparently, nobody who he had seen in the hospital knew anything about it either. Um, so, first we spent an hour, I sent the medical student across the street to fill a script for the liquid concentrated morphine, and what is a critically important other script that had to be filled at the same time? Something for the bowel. Laxative, thank you. Never prescribe an opioid without a laxative. Leave here with nothing else, remember that. Um, so Mr. Mrs. B and me and the students sat in the nurse's lunchroom and practiced her drawing up a quarter cc on a one cc syringe um, over and over till we, we were convinced she had the high uh, eye hand and fine motor coordination to do that safely and she practiced mixing up a scoop of Miralax and a glass of water again until we were all convinced that she could do this safely and effectively and then we did something called teach back, where we told her, we wrote down, and we told her how often she could use this morphine, how many times she could give it before she needed to call someone, how long she had to wait in between doses, how often to give the laxative every day, whether he needs it or not, um, until she could tell us this back very comfortably. Then we put them in a taxi and sent them home. Nine o'clock. Was I done? I knew nothing about the, the safety of the home, and I'm sending them home on a, a drug that is associated with falls. So fortunately, Mount Sinai, we have a house calls practice called, called visiting doctors. Um, this house calls practice exists predominantly on, on the generosity of foundations and individual donors, because our healthcare system doesn't really cover this sort of thing. And by now, I've been around long enough that I know everybody in the system. And so I called the head of the visiting doctors program, her name is Linda. At, at this point, quarter after nine, I had her cell phone. I said, hey, Linda, this is Diane. I need your help. I'm about to send an 88-year-old patient with dementia home on morphine. That got her attention. Can you guys see him tomorrow morning? So they have, a, they have something like 2,000 patients on their census and a waiting list of 500 patients. It is almost impossible to get into this program. The demand for it far exceeds the resources it has. But they always prioritize palliative care patients. So they went to see him at 9 o'clock the next morning, where they found all kinds of disasters waiting to happen. No elevated toilet seat in the bathroom. No grab bar in the bathroom. Loose throw rugs everywhere. Electrical wires crisscrossing the floor. They did a refrigerator biopsy. The only food in the refrigerator was old Chinese food. Why? Because Mrs. B could not go out grocery shopping because Mr. B freaked out as she left. And he couldn't go with her. Um, the worst thing was that their couch, which they had bought in the 1960s, again, you guys are too young to remember this, but back then, it was cool to have couches that were about a foot off the floor. That was their living room couch. So that's where they sat to watch TV after dinner. Now, I couldn't get up from there without help. 
So everything about the place that he lived was precipitating this problem. This is three hospitalizations and four ED visits later. So what did they do? They called in the certified home health agency, the OT, the PT, elevated toilet seat, grab bars, got rid of the loose throw rugs, got him one of those really cool chairs where you push the button, and it helps you stand up, which as I think back on it is probably the most important thing that we did. Um, ordered Meals on Wheels, asked Mr. and Mrs. B if they had family. They have a daughter who lives where? They all live in California. <laughs> she lives in California. Had they spoken to her about what's going on? No, they did not want to worry her. <laughs> were they a member of a faith community? Yes, they were a member of a faith community. Hadn't been able to go for almost a year because of the mobility problems. Um, do we have permission to call the daughter? Do we have permission to call the minister in their Greek Orthodox congregation? They gave permission for both. Their daughter now orders groceries online that are delivered every week and visits a hell of a lot more often than she used to because now she knows what's going on. We called the minister who, as it turned out, was new just as this couple stopped going. They kind of fell through the cracks. But this church community, like every faith community, just about every faith community, has a friendly visitor program for shut-ins that we hadn't been taking advantage of because nobody connected the dots. So now he has a friendly visitor, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon for two to three hours. Monday and Wednesday, it's high school students on community service. Friday, it's a member of the congregation. Sunday, they send a car, they pick them both up, take them to services, give them lunch, and bring them home. So um, here's the point I want to make. So what happened before that ED attending happened to remember his one week rotation with me eight years earlier. Because this, we didn't get called because it was standardized or because there was any organization to make that happen in cases like this. It was pure luck that we got called. Four 911 calls, four ED visits, three hospitalizations, one of which led to urosepsis because somebody left a catheter in his bladder from the ED. Because we used to do that, we don't do that anymore in the ED, but back then we used to routinely put catheters in people's bladders because it was easier than cleaning up after them. Um, he went to the ICU where he developed delirium, pressure ulcers, immobility, worsening mental status, and through some miracle survived. Um, our, again, tender administrations. His wife was at his bedside from 6 a.m. to midnight every day. <coughs> So her stress and exhaustion was incredible. So what happened when me and my medical student got to the ED, we made the house calls referral. They organized the home redesign. The pain management turns out that once we stop precipitating back spasm, he hardly ever needs that morphine. It sits in the refrigerator. I think he's used it once or twice in six years since then, but it's there. So that if there's a crisis at 3 in the morning, there's something that can be done. The house calls practice has meaningful 24-7 coverage, meaning you never get a tape. And they pride themselves on answering, returning the call within 15 minutes. Because if you don't return the call within 15 minutes and somebody can't breathe or someone's in pain, what are they going to do? Call 911. And this practice gets part of its funding from managed care contracts and expected to keep people out of the hospital. Support for Mrs. B, Meals on Wheels, and Fresh Direct, Friendly Visitor Program. He is now 96 years old, still living at home with his wife, has not once been back in the ED or the hospital. Now look at these two columns, and tell me which one is easier to get in the current healthcare system. Usual. Which one is low value care? Very poor quality, incredibly high cost. Right. I, I assume everyone agrees that's the left hand column. So our task, particularly that of the next generation in this room, is to make the right hand column a standard of care and the left hand column a never event. And think about what we're going to have to do as a society in terms of policy, payment, and training, and public communication and public awareness to make the right-hand column the demand 
of the public, the people we care for. Uh, that's, that's your task, next generation. So remember I said to you that 5% of patients account for about half of all healthcare spending. Let's assume that's a pie. I'm going to um, ask you what fraction of the pie, of the costliest 5%, do you think are in the last year of life? Not six months, but year. What fraction of the costliest patients are nearing death in a year? 40%? Any other guesses? <coughs> Sorry? 85? Any other guesses? 25. 25. Ah, it's getting closer. 11%. So why are you surprised? Because we read all the time in the paper about how much money we waste on care of the dying. How do they analyze that? They look back from among people who died on the spending before they died. Who do they not look back on? The ones who are still alive. Right? We know as you get sicker and sicker, we spend more money. We don't know who's going to die, so we can't say whether that spending is beneficial or not. It's beneficial for a lot of people, but it's an artifact of bad statistics. And so when you read that stuff, treat it with skepticism. Actually, half of the costliest 5% have a one-time high cost and get better. I was scheduled to do this lecture last February. And I couldn't do it because I had to have a mitral valve repair on February 11th. I went to Cleveland Clinic to get my mitral valve repair. I fell into this group in 2019. Cleveland Clinic is not cheap. The mitral valve repair was probably somewhere around seventy-five dollars to $80,000. So I'm in the cost of least 5% for this calendar year. But I'm fine now, not good. Um, and I'm not in a group that needs palliative care or any particularly higher level of treatment. So just knowing who's in a high cost group does not identify the population at risk. And yet, what do we use to identify the population at risk? Claims data, claims data, billing data, um, how much we spent. That's helpful, but it's far from sufficient. But it's the remainder of the group, this group, the Mr. B's of our society, who are functionally impaired, maybe cognitively impaired, need somebody to help them get through the day, have one or multiple chronic conditions with which they live for many years. And safety and obesity, COPD, heart failure, frailty, dementia, not dying. So if you then say, okay, the green and the blue is the group that needs palliative care, of whom only 11, you know, 11 of 51%, of 20% of the total are in retrospect in the last year of life. Who is this population? So that's the cost of these 2.5%. And these are the characteristics. Functional impairment, frailty, cognitive impairment, Exhausted, overwhelmed family caregivers, social and behavioral health challenges. So, Mr. B, mobility impairments, frailty, can't walk a block anymore, cognitive impairment, exhausted, overwhelmed family caregiver. Who calls 911? The family caregiver. Food insecurity, social isolation, <coughs> transportation problems doesn't really have, I mean, he's still here six years later because um, his wife is incredible as a caregiver, probably, because um, they get the level of support they need at home. But it, how, how would we find him if we were looking at claims and serious illness diagnoses? We would miss him altogether because we don't mandate that you put functional status and cognitive status in the electronic medical record. We don't assess family caregivers for feeling distraught and overwhelmed and exhausted, yet those are the main predictors of utilization. All right, finally getting to the point here. Um, so what is palliative care? 
This definition, by the way, came from audience research with 950 likely voters oversampling among the elderly and we and oversampling among um, African American, Latino, and Asian older Americans. And what we did was ask, we gave a long list of characteristics of care that someone might want if they had a serious illness. And it included things like peaceful death, end of life care, hospice. It also included other terms. And I will tell you that a peaceful death, end of life care, and hospice did not get ranked by anyone. No one is interested in signing up for that. Do you find that surprising? Nobody wants to die. I mean, it's sort of an evolutionary fact of our species. So what they did rank was specialized medical care for people with serious illness, not advanced illness, not terminal illness, serious illness. Because serious doesn't imply you're dying. Focused on improving quality of life, that was actually ranked first um, in terms of preference. <coughs> Addresses pain, symptoms, and stress. Provided by a team, that was ranked second, which I thought was really interesting. But I guess it implied to people that it meant that we talked to each other. Um, and people realized that a lot of the time we don't talk to each other. And that doesn't lead to good care. Um, and that it's appropriate in any age, any stage, any diagnosis at the same time as curative or life prolonging disease treatments. So when I went to medical school in the dark ages, this is what we were taught. We do everything, 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 and then suddenly maybe we remember to throw them over the wall to hospice, as if yesterday was different than today. That's the old either or model. Either we're curing you or we're letting you die peacefully. Does that make sense for the vast majority of patients who need both throughout the entire course of illness? Mr. B, six years later, still needs the comprehensive interdisciplinary care he's getting. He might die tomorrow. He might die in three more years. I really don't know. Prognosis doesn't help me. Need helps me. And um, nowadays, we usually use a sine wave because patients' needs go up and down and up and down. Crisis, stable, crisis, stable. So synonyms, palliative care, People are starting to avoid using the term because it is commonly linked with hospice. And that scares people off, because hospice scares people off. And so people are using terms like advanced illness management, advanced care, supportive care, serious illness care. Just know for yourself they are all the same thing. Same focus. This is the growth in hospital palliative care in the U.S. This is old, but as of 2018, um, we're at 72% of hospitals with more than 50 beds have palliative care teams, and 94% of hospitals with more than 300 beds, including your very own hospital, um, have palliative care teams. Uh, this is our latest state-by-state -state report card with the dark navy and the light blue are A and B states, meaning more than 60% of hospitals in these states have palliative care teams. That now accounts for 48 of, uh, 38 of the 50 states. Only 12 states are orange or purple, which is fewer than 40%. Uh, fewer than 60% have hospital palliative care. And you can see that they're concentrated in the south. And why might they be concentrated in the South, the ones with less access to palliative care? What do you know about hospitals in the South? Anybody? Sorry? They're rural. They're rural. There tend to be smaller hospitals. What else? That's where most of the for-profit hospitals are in the U.S. Um, and uh, so it's both. You, you, have, you can't segregate the tax status from the location when you try to do it statistically. They, they move in the same direction. So everything, as in everything in healthcare, everything depends on where you live. Um, access to palliative care depends on where you live. 
So what's the problem with having good, you know, not good enough, but getting better access to hospital quality care? And everybody has access to hospice. Does anyone here know the eligibility criteria for access to hospice? Students? Needs or adults? The, uh, adults. Right, prognosis of less than six months if the disease follows its usual course, and what else? What else does the patient have to sign? I know you know. Sign out of regular Medicare. Tom, I know you know too. I was trying make people realize that they don't know and they should know. So there's two criteria for hospice. You have two doctors have to sign a piece of paper saying you are likely to be dead in six months if the disease follows its usual course. I don't know about you, but I cannot predict who's going to be dead in six months. I would have predicted Mr. B would have been dead in six months, six years later. He's not dead. Also, the patient, him or herself, or their loved one, if they're not able to sign, literally has to sign a piece of paper signing away their right to regular Medicare coverage for treatment of their terminal illness. Having counseled many, many patients to go and to get hospice, that is the hardest part. Because who wants to sign away their right to insurance coverage for disease treatment? But that's how we designed this benefit um, in, in, in an effort to save money. You force people to choose between life prolonged treatment for their terminal illness or basically palliative care for their terminal illness. And the result of that is very, very short median length of stay in hospice. So the median length of stay in hospice, does anyone know? 18 days. Six month benefit. But you've got to be, everyone has to agree you're on the brink of death where most people get to hospice. 30% get it for less than a week, 10% for less than 24 hours. Because we designed the benefit wrong, um, and we haven't changed it. So what we have here is access to hospital palliative care, access to brink of death palliative care. Where are most people with serious illness? They are not dying, and they are not in the hospital. They're in their community. They may be in assisted living or in a nursing home. They get their medical care in their clinician's office. This is the new frontier. So that people get what Mr. B got. Office, home, institutional, we have a long way to go. We're just starting to map access to palliative care in offices, nursing homes, and in-home programs. This is probably an underestimate because it's a convenience and snowball sample. But it's more than we anticipated, actually. Uh, interestingly, of the in-home palliative care programs, 50% are run by hospices that are delivering non-hospice palliative care. So that's an important uh, camel's nose under the tent to improve this. And of the nursing home, non-hospice palliative care programs, roughly 80% are run by hospices. So there is this, um, I hope, continuing trend of hospices recognizing that the Medicare hospice benefit fails to meet the needs of most serious little people in their community because of the eligibility criteria. So remember, I talked to you about palliative care and value. The numerator, quality, these are the various of the outcomes that have been shown to improve in lots of different studies, lots of different patient populations and settings. And as a result, of improving these things, what happens? You don't need to call 911, like Mr. B, because your needs are met at home. Right? So the cost savings, it is really important to understand, do not occur if you don't improve quality. Because if you're somebody's husband or wife, and your partner can't catch her breath, in the middle of the night, and you're worried she's going to choke, and you can't reach anybody, you call 911. 
So if you do not have a plan in place that anticipates these predictable symptom crises, say your spouse has COPD, breathing crises are predictable and recurrent. If you don't have lawyers working in the house, your patient will end up in the ED in the hospital. And that, that's on us, guys. We don't blame the patient and the family for that. So as Don Berwick likes to say, the cost reduction is an epiphenomenon, he uses 10 cent words, um, or a side effect of better quality. This is an old study now, nine years old, New England Journal, randomized controlled trial of palliative care at the same time as best lung cancer care at Mass General. They anticipated improved quality of life in the intervention group. They got a marked reduction in major depression in the intervention group, less utilization in the two weeks before death, but this was not a primary outcome. This was a secondary outcome. But they were shocked and surprised to find a nearly 2.7 month gain in life expectancy in the palliative care group. That's how this got published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One of the editors said to me, we only published it because we didn't believe it. <laughs> we said, and we wanted it to start some debate. So why, let's just say for the sake of argument, this is true. Why might it be true that people who get palliative care might live longer? Same reason as to be stay around. Which is? Preventative care. Preventative care. What did he stay out of? Pain. A hospital. <laughs> what do we know about hospitals? Very dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Some people think it's the third leading cause of death in the United States. Now, if you're Mr. B, we almost did kill him with our neurosepsis and our ICU stay, delirium, et cetera. If you have cancer and you are hospitalized for a pain crisis or a dyspnea crisis, what happens to you? You get C. diff and you die. Hospitals are really dangerous for immunosuppressed patients as well as for ill older patients. So my particular bet is on staying out of the hospital as the reason for longer life expectancy. Other people think it's the depression impact. Depression is an independent predictor of mortality in virtually every disease in which it's been looked at, heart failure, COPD, dementia, cancer. So whether depression is a co-traveler or the etiologic factor, we don't know. When I'm speaking to patients and families, they look at this and say, of course, the patients feel better, they, they have a reason to go on. Life is worth living. It seems like a duh to the public. But the medical professions cannot understand this. It's, it's a disconnect. It's so fascinating how much we have drunk the Kool Aid of what we do as a profession. Um, this was one of the early um, cluster randomized control trials done by Camilla Zimmerman in um, Canada that found better outcomes on the quality of life scale. Um, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis by our colleague Dia Cavaliratos when he was at University of Pittsburgh that found improved quality outcomes, no difference in survival in this particular analysis, but better quality outcomes. This study I find really profound. This is Ethan Bosch, who at the time that he did this was at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He's now at UNC. There have now been three or four studies finding similar things. This is not a palliative care study, or not so new, shall we say. So what they did was give cancer patients at Memorial an app on which they were to report their symptom burden every day. And if they reported a symptom, that was moderate or severe, there was someone who would get that signal at the hospital and call them back. Right? So we didn't wait for the patient to be in a crisis and call us. And you know patients don't like to bother their doctors, especially their oncologists, because they're so busy. They want their oncologists to focus on curing them. So they wait till they can't breathe to call them. But this time we say, we want to know how you're feeling and we want you to tell us everything. 
And this study found a significant survival advantage of those who had the app. Now, this is cheap. This is easy. This is what some people call primary palliative care. Symptom burden matters. Patients knew somebody was watching out for them and cared about how they were feeling, and they came to expect that something would be done, because it was. So those nurses were working under algorithms and protocols, and if whatever they tried didn't work, they would take it upstairs either to the oncologist or to the palliative care team at the cancer center. There have now been four or five similar studies done. Why isn't this standard practice in cancer centers? Or for that matter, in heart failure practices, or pulmonary practices, or transplant practices? It's so simple. Okay. All right. This is a randomized trial at Kaiser of palliative care versus regular home care. You can see there were three times as many home visits in the palliative care group. But it was Kaiser, so they could see the decline in utilization in all the other settings. Four to one return on investment. Now Kaiser and the VA do this across their whole group of business, home-based palliative care. These are the cost avoidance um, systematic reviews. Uh, that you can look at at your leisure. Um, so how does it work? These are the six top characteristics that all have to be in place to get these outcomes. Adequately staffed and educated teams in the appropriate settings. Adequately staffed is almost never the case for palliative care. It is not the case at Sinai. It is not the case anywhere. All, all palliative care teams are drowning. That's not going to lead to population level outcomes. Screen and target the highest risk people. Ask people what matters most to them. Support family because they're the ones who call 911. Expert pain and symptom management. Mr. B saw 78 doctors before he saw me. Nobody had been trained in the safe and appropriate use of opioids. And 24 7 access. Last time I checked, bad things happen after 5 o'clock. If you get a tape that says call 911, that's exactly what you're going to do. Um, goal setting. Don't ask people what their goals are. They'll think you're talking about soccer. Um, ask them what is most important to them. In this study of seniors in a senior center, they were asked to choose between three priorities. Living longer, relief from pain and other symptoms, or remaining independent. What do you think they ranked first? Three quarters rank remaining independent first, followed by pain and symptom management, and dead last, unintended, living longer. <laughs> How is the system designed? Just the opposite. I'm going to have to skip this case study, um, but you can read the paper. It was in Health Affairs a few years ago. Um, and I will close with this quote from Albert Einstein, who wrote, um, actually before the war, in the world as I see it, every day I remind myself that my inner and outer life are based on the labors of other men, I had to add, and women, living and dead, and that I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received, and I'm still receiving. So thank you again for the privilege of speaking with you today. sponsors today, which include the Johns Hopkins Palliative Medicine Program and uh, the Hospital Ethics Committees, both here at Johns Hopkins Hospital and at the Medical Center. All right, with that, the floor is open. I presume that there are questions, comments. We've talked throughout, but I'm sure that there's, there are things you want to ask. Let's wait for the microphone, please, so we can catch you on the tape. Uh, great talk. My name is Rami. Uh, hello. So, um, a lot of hospitals are embracing palliative care based primarily on the cost of savings. Um, let's say you fast forward 20, 30 years and it's now the standard. Uh, are we going to have trouble 
growing palliative care when we no longer show cost savings, when we're not really measuring quality of life? And where do you kind of see that? That is such an excellent question. The question is, once we've you know, got the low-hanging fruit in terms of savings, you can't keep reducing the spending at infinitum. And if that's the standard we're going to be held to, uh, we won't survive. And I should point out that we are the only service that is held to that standard. Um, and that's completely inappropriate. Um, we don't exist to save money for the hospital. We exist to improve care for the patient and the family. It is a moral imperative. It is an ethical imperative. And we really have to lead with that and the quality outcomes. It is a side effect and epiphenomenon that some inappropriate care that is on a glide path, because that's how we've always done it, um, probably won't happen for some people, but hopefully that will be less and less. Um, my particular focus is on getting accountability for access to palliative care right now. It is not a joint commission requirement. If it becomes a joint commission requirement or other deemed accrediting bodies requirement, we won't be held to it. You must save money or you can't exist standard. Um, it's interesting that oncology is not held to that standard. Cardiology is not held to that standard. And you can think about why in the current payment system. Um, but we've got to move beyond palliative care being a nice to have to palliative care being a have to have, and that it has to meet certain basic quality standards in order to be eligible, um, which is our current fight. Well, you have this one. You like to wander. I do too. You look too tethered over there. Okay. Who's next? seems to make so much sense. So why is there such a fight and what is that fight? Another really great question. That's what I want to know. Like, what don't people get about this, right? So I think there are a couple of reasons. One is the fact that we are often referred to in one breath as hospice and palliative care. And it's understandable because the field grew out of the work that hospice did. Um, but we are not hospice. Think about Mr. B. Um, and so language sloppiness, lack of message discipline has really created a problem in that most of our colleagues in healthcare, especially doctors, think it's only appropriate at the brink of death. Um, and so even when a patient comes in and says, you know, I read that palliative care helps people stay home and might even help prolong their lives, could you please refer me? Nine out of 10 doctors say, oh, you don't need that palliative care. You're not dying. And the patient's not going to argue with their oncologist because they don't want to piss off the oncologist. Um, so we have seen the enemy, and it is us. It is our own colleagues. Um, our own, as a specialty, failure of message discipline and clarity. Um, and then the last reason is we don't get paid like oncologists and cardiologists do, so we don't get elevated. I mean, it really is follow the money. Um, the, the quality case for palliative care is very clear, but there are lots of quality cases out there that get ignored because they don't bring a lot of money. Pediatrics, geriatrics, all kinds of fields that are cognitive and not procedural. Um, and we have a healthcare system that is driven by reimbursement. Right now. I could go on, but that's enough. <laughs> right, maybe one more, one more question. I really don't even need a mic. <laughs> Thank you for a great talk. Um, so you said yourself in the Mr. and Mrs. B example that Mrs. B was incredible. Um, what would have happened to Mr. B if she was either cognitively impaired or <laughs> Wasn't around. He'd been dead a long time ago. Family caregivers do. Um, what what should happen? That's really what I mean. What, what should happen? What is the system? What's, what's the so caregivers are the reason that people with chronic illness live so long in this country. It is unpaid work. It is untrained work. It is unrecognized work. Um, I think is the statistic 450 billion or 450 million? It must be billion in uncompensated care. 
uh, delivered by family and caregivers. Right? Yeah. Um, and at the sacrifice of their own health and well-being and also driving more utilization for them. And this is not going to get better as my generation gets older. It's going to get much more marked. So we're going to have to develop policy that supports family caregivers. And for people who, as we say in geriatrics, are unbefriended, don't have family, don't have friends. There are a lot of places, so for example, Oregon, they have boarded care homes, and they pay for that. So these are people who open their homes to three or four people, and it's like a family, and they have dinner together. And of course, they do really well, and the state pays some minimal sum of money to these people who do this. Um, and they're not trained medical professionals. And they don't have all those rules and regs that nursing homes have. Um, we're just going to have to get over ourselves and start looking for practical solutions like that. Thank you for being here.